All rise. Wait, 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 wait. The International Criminal Court is now in session. The Dance of the Corporal International, 8 to word. Please be seated. Wait, what's this one? Thank you very much. Court officer, please announce the case. Thank you, Mr. President. The situation in the Republic of Kenya, in the case of the prosecutor against William Samuel Ruto and Joshua Arab Seng, ICC 0109-0111. We are in open session. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Steinberg? Yes, good morning, Your Honours. This morning the prosecution is, well, there's one change. Uh, Melissa Sims is in the place of Liche Zaga. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. President. Our team remains the same. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honours. Mr. Sang's team remains the same. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, Your Honours, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, the defence team for Mr. Ruto, who's in court, remains the same. Thank you very much. Um, for the purposes of our procedure this morning, there is um, another witness, one of the uh, second summons, summons witness. Um, is has appeared and we will need to go into private session to discuss procedural matters relating to that witness. We will now go into private session. We are in open session, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Um, we adjourned yesterday with the arguments being made on the prosecutor's application to have witness 604 declared a hostile witness, and their instance, Ms. Bousman was about to address the court on the matter, Ms. Bousman. Your Honours, perhaps before Ms. Bousman rises, um, we were sent a schedule yesterday saying that we would break after this witness and recommence at 10 o'clock, so we don't have the right team in court at the moment. Um, well, there'll only be one change, but uh, I don't know whether Your Honours are planning to change that schedule. We sent from CMS at uh, 1629, saying that the second session would be from 10 to 11.30. I see that. I see that. Um. All right. I was wondering whether it was necessary to proceed, but I understand it is necessary because of technical matters that need to be attended to in Nairobi. So we are joined now and come back at 10. All rise. We'll All rise. We will be. Please be seated. Boy was this one. Thank you very much, Ms. Bosman. Uh, Mr. President, before my learned friend uh, rises, can I just ask, uh, raise one short matter so the bench can consider it? Um, Your Honour, I'd like some clarification from the bench. Mr. Root has been here uh, all this week, uh, and I wanted clarification. Is he required to be here on Monday, which would, or, or is he released at the end of today? Of course, he had planned official duties back in Kenya so that he was here this week in compliance with the court order. Of course, we'd very much like it for him to go back and resume those duties. And that's why I raised the application now, or the uh, 
I raise this issue for guidance from the bench. He's released at the end of today. He's been here five days. Or uh, do you require him to be here uh, over the weekend and then, of course, on, on Monday? Uh, that would, of course, cause uh, inconvenience in relation to official duties that have already been scheduled back home. Uh, we will get back to you on that in, in the course of the day. I'm most grateful. Ms. Bassman. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. Um, I actually have a few authorities to hand out. Uh, I won't dwell on them, but I thought for a matter of clarification. So if you could... There's, there's like three. Yesterday, <coughs> we spoke about, uh, well, first of all, let me uh, state our position clearly. We share uh, all the observations already made by the Ruta de Defense on this. Um, at best, this application is premature, but first and foremost, we think it should be rejected. The general position is, as we have discussed yesterday, that a party may not discredit his own witness, and they should not call a witness for the simple um, reason to, to uh, put him down. And just to give a reference for that, that has already been discussed yesterday, <clears throat> one of them that I just uh, gave out is the Limay case, 1 February 2005, at page 2736, uh, lines 12 and 13, which is the general position set out. And uh, importantly, at lines... Sorry, wait one second. Which document are we referring to now? This is um, uh, the case of Limay, ICTY, 1 February 2005, at page 2736. 2736. Right. So at, at lines 12 and 13, the general position is set out that, um, as I just said, um, a party should not call a witness just to discredit a witness. And um, at lines 17 and 18, importantly, is, as, as my learned colleague yesterday already stated, there is a material distinction between an unfavorable witness and an adverse one. So it doesn't, it's not sufficient for someone to give unfavorable answers. It must be an adverse witness, and that must be shown, as, as is stated at line 20. Um, yesterday, we heard this uh, from Mr. Khan, and he cited the Katanga but, case. But let me stop you there. Is that first the same thing as hostile? In legal terms, yes. Is it? Continue. You can be, uh, to, there's a limited uh, extent to which a, a witness can adverse that doesn't necessarily qualify as hostile, if that's what you mean. But in this uh, in particular situation where a, um, a witness at least must adverse to the party in order to qualify as hostile, it's a minimum criteria. Um, and what does that mean? It means, as, as Mr. Kahn pointed out yesterday, that someone is not desirous of telling the truth 
And again, I just uh, referred to the to the, the references in Limai at page 2736, line 24 up to 2737, line 1. And that's also repeated at 2738, lines 3 to 7. Um, and then there's also another reference at page 2143. I don't want to go too much into details in that. But the most important thing is, and this is also cited yesterday in the Lubanga decision cited by my colleague, at, this is page 89 of the transcripts, uh, there must be a wholesale change of account, and there is no such thing in this case. It doesn't sufficient, it's not sufficient that someone is somewhat evasive and doesn't give the exact answers that the, the, pro, the prosecution or the party calling the witness uh, wants to hear. It also doesn't, uh, it's not sufficient that someone departs from his statement. It has, has to be a very fundamental change of account. And in this particular situation, we're dealing with two statements that he's given. One that is uh, favorable to the prosecution and another one that's recounting. And the, the prosecution has made, uh, has taken a position that the first one is the accurate one and the second one is not. Um, uh, uh, so that there, there is already that as, as a starting ground uh, is if the witness sticks to his second statement, does that make him, um, th does that make him someone who departs from a statement he made earlier? And let me uh, emphasize, because in Katanga, this is also one of the, the um, I just handed that out as well, and this was also referred to yesterday, um, the case was uh, somewhat, well, it was actually much different in the sense that we dealt with a witness who was giving a lot of information and a lot of information that he wasn't giving in court. And in fact, it went way further than what we've seen here. He didn't go into any of the details about the presence of civilians, ch child soldiers, existence of, um, um, of munition and supply. And yet, the chamber came to the conclusion that this was not a hostile witness, and they said, and this is at lines 3 to 10 in your, this is page 20 of your, also your handout. I mean, that's, this is where they say, uh, minimizing previous declarations or statements with regard to previous subjects or answers, none of this is, is sufficient, or answers that are not as complete. So that's, as far as we are concerned, the standard. And but we're so far from any of this, Mr. President, because we're dealing with someone who has not been evasive at all, has been answering all your questions, and uh, there's only been one time when he said, um, I'm reserving my right not to incriminate myself, but when you give the explanation you did, he, he was uh, very perfectly happy to answer the question. So we haven't seen a witness who's been evasive, we have not seen a witness who was not willing to answer any questions. And contrary to what the uh, prosecution asserted, um, we were talking about demeanor. They said demeanor is not that important. Well, again, I have a reference for that in the Limai case that, in fact, uh, demeanor is important. And um, in this particular case, he had a, a perfectly, he had a demeanor of someone who was telling the truth, who was uh, giving answers um, as, as he knew them um, well. And so we, uh, we see no, there's absolutely no evidence of either an adverse or a hostile witness, so we are very far. Uh, in addition, the prosecution hasn't explored any of the areas that they could have explored. Um, they, uh, the, the witness said uh, some of it I told them earlier was true and some of it was not true. Until to now we haven't heard what was true and what is not true because they didn't actually ask any follow-up questions. Um, so um, on, in, in addition, we know that uh, the prosecution said this witness is averse to us as a party because he stopped cooperating. And um, he was, he's here uh, under, uh, he's only here because he was compelled to turn up. 
which it, it's true that he was ordered to, to turn up, but he did. And there was no suggestion, there's no, been no suggestion yet that he's facing penalties if he doesn't. So he did come by his own volition. It's very important. And it's also true that um, the, he has given, as I said, he's given uh, lots of answers and he hasn't been uh, exonerating any of us. Um, he's giving his statement and I think at this statement we should um, uh, just carry on listening to what he has to say. It's inconsistent with the previous statement, so I need to explore that. Isn't that the bottom line in all of this? Has that happened? Your Honours, in the prosecution submission, yes, it has happened, and I will demonstrate that shortly. But before I, I go off the, the point of the statement, the fact that he has confirmed, sorry, the affidavit, the fact that he has confirmed that affidavit in my submission is sufficient. It's not necessary for him to confirm, to, to have read out each and every paragraph. He said he made that statement three, three weeks ago. He knows what's in it. He confirms it. That statement recants material portions of his original statement. But it goes further than that. But he also says, understand, when questioned, the witness did say, in my previous, in the affidavit, some things I said in it were false and some things true. Yes. If I'm wrong, correct me. Also said the same thing about the previous statement. Some things in the previous statement are false. Some things I said in the previous statement are true. If, that, right is, if that is the case, is there no necessity even an obligation to say, okay, let's now, not everything you say in a statement might be of interest to the court. So it may well be that what you have in mind as true or false may not be of interest, but there are some things that are of interest. Let's go to those areas. I'm interested in this. You elicit the, you ask a question. In area of critical interest to you, and see what answer you receive, and all that, afterwards you say, now, well, it's not. I've tried other means and there was no way of getting the witness to, uh, to the initial statement or what was said in the statement. So I have no choice but to do this. Your, Your Honours, one, one, firstly, one observation. I do not recall the witness at any time saying that anything in his affidavit was untrue. Maybe. He did say that in his original statement there were things that were true and untrue, but the affidavit he confirmed, he said he remembered what was in it, and he confirmed it. That's my recollection. As for the, as for the previous statement, Your Honours. Mr. President, uh, per perhaps uh, we should not just gloss over this. Uh, we seem to have different understandings of what the witness may have said. Perhaps we could be guided by counsel uh, on which parts of the transcript did he say that he confirms that everything he said in his affidavit was true. I do not seem to have that recollection, and perhaps we could be guided to the transcript where he said everything contained in there is true. My recollection is he remembered that, yes, he made this affidavit. He confirmed that that is the affidavit he made, and I could not recall him going further than that with regards to the affidavit. Thank you. And Mr. President, perhaps uh, we recall counsel was confusing the affidavit and the statement constantly. Even the fact that you had to prod, prod him about that fact, that confusion remained. Thank you. Your Honours, may I firstly observe, I, I'm a bit at a loss as to who my opponent is in this matter. One moment Mr. Fall jumps up, the next moment Mr. Khan jumps up. I do recall, Your Honours, saying at the beginning of the case that the counsel who is taking the witness should be the one who tends to the argument. This seems to be causing my colleagues some amusement on the other side, but I'm sure they would be less amused if Mr. Garcia and Ms. Zago started jumping up in turn to reply to their submissions. My understanding is that if the lead counsel wishes to make a submission on a subject and he is not leading the witness, he should at least have the courtesy of asking the leave of the court to make such submissions. But 
We can look at that topic, but I would prefer not to interrupt the substance of my argument. If I may, I'll come back to that. Um, turning then to his original statement, it's true, Your Honours, that I haven't taken him through it paragraph by paragraph. I intend in total, something like 80 paragraphs of his statement he's already denied. Now, I haven't cross-examined him on it, Your Honours, and I am aware that in some jurisdictions there is an intermediate step which may be taken but is not necessarily taken, which is to request the Chamber to, for permission to cross-examine or ask closed questions on a previous inconsistent statement. And after that, the application to declare hostile is made, and if granted, the prosecution is then permitted to cross-examine at large on issues uh, extraneous to the, to the, to the statements, uh, other issues that might be relevant to the truth or veracity of his version. Your Honours, I chose not to take that step because, in my view, far from being premature, it is crystal clear what is going on with this witness. And anybody in this courtroom who hasn't, is not wearing blinkers should be able to see what's going on with this witness in my respectful submission. And I'm quite happy to go through that intermediate step if the Chamber feels it's necessary. But I, I submit, Your Honours, that we, we are well past that point. Um, so you've, list, you've list, listed a number of areas, so that you, something that wasn't done in the when you first spoke. Are there any other areas of interest beyond those that areas have already identified as of interest to you that the witness answered questions that are inconsistent with what he said in the statement? Your Honours, I, I, I don't have to hand any further examples other than those mentioned in the effort. No, 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 I'm talking about looking forward. Yes, Your Honours, there are, there are other, other areas, such as uh, what became of this witness after the election. There, there are certainly further, further areas. Uh, in regards to the statement, there are uh, various uh, extraneous issues uh, that, that have been the subject of uh, the recent reg Regulation 35 request to add additional material to the uh, prosecution's list of evidence with which the prosecution would like to confront this witness and which we say will explain his sudden change of, um, of heart at the last, at the last moment. Um, Your Honours, my, <laughs> my learned friends have said this witness has not provided any exculpatory evidence. Well, I must observe that the defense's definition of exculpatory evidence seems to change depending on the circumstance. When it comes to the disclosure of evidence, all manners of evidence are alleged to be potentially exculpatory. This witness has claimed before the court that members of the prosecution are engaged, at least in his case, in deliberately falsifying evidence against the two accused. If that is not exculpatory, I would be grateful that my learned friends would place that on record that they don't, do not regard that as being exculpatory. Secondly, he has, for the first time in this court, he has, for the first time in this court, alleged that he was put up to, to this by another prosecution witness whose, whose name is not on record yet, but, but his name does appear in, in his affidavit as the person who introduced him to the prosecution. Again, the concept of exculpatory evidence includes evidence which will hurt the credibility of a prosecution witness. And if that is not enough, paragraph 18 of his affidavit, he states the following. To the best of my knowledge, Mrs. William Samoy Ruto and Joshua Arab Sang were not involved in post-election violence in any capacity whatsoever. Has he said that in his testimony before the court? Not yet, Your Honours. All oh, right. But he has.
confirmed, I, I say, uh, but we'll check that, uh, his, his affidavit that he signed before Mr. Matai. Um, Your Honours, the Katanga argument, the Katanga uh, uh, jurisprudence does not assist my learned friends. We've gone far beyond a witness who's simply evasive and not forthcoming with the answers that the prosecution might expect him to bring. He's a witness who has positively and explicitly recanted his earlier evidence. And again, if I may return to the Lubanga decision, which I submit is far more on point in this matter. I read previously at paragraph 19, and I, I do actually have copies for the chamber if if you would like copies, Your Honours, I can hand them up. We have found it in the meantime. Thank you, Your Honours. Reading then from paragraph 20, which follows on from the extract I read yesterday, and this is, for the record, decision 2201, redacted in the Lubanga case, trial chamber. Whilst it is instructive to review the approach taken by other courts and tribunals to the problem presented by witnesses who substantially alter testimony alter their testimony or who seek to change their written testimony, it is important that the Chamber does not create unnecessary, quote, rules of evidence, unquote, which may prove in the long term to be unhelpfully inflexible or artificial. Nonetheless, under the rule applied in other jurisdictions that a witness must have demonstrated hostility to the party calling him or her before that party can impeach the witness's credit or contradict him by other evidence, there can be no doubt that witness 15 has shown, quote, hostility, unquote, towards or is adverse to the prosecution. The change in his account is fundamental, since he is seemingly resiled from some of the central elements of his first witness statement. That fact, according to the bench in the trial chamber in Labanga, was sufficient for a finding of hostility. No additional... Um, demeanor elements or um, adverse animus was required where we have that fact. I am aware that in certain common law jurisdictions they do look further, but in certain they do not. Does it matter, Mr. Steinberg, that the Lubanga precedent you've, sat, uh, uh, you've now involved? may have certain circumstances in it that we have not yet seen here, and that is perhaps what counsel on the opposite side are saying. If you look at paragraph 3, for example, of the Lupanga, paragraph 3, paragraph 4, paragraph 12, paragraph 16, isn't that a situation where more or less the prosecution is being forced to proceed with a testimony of a witness as their witness. Um, that was a situation so I understood what happened. Uh, the witness at some point uh, was excused for the prosecutor to meet with the witness again and take further statements or a statement. And after that, the prosecutor said, um, in light of what we've now learned from this witness, uh, we no longer want to continue with this witness. Uh, effectively, we want to withdraw the witness. And that then created uh, the interesting legal scenario in a purely common law courtroom where you would have all right what happens to this witness uh, if the defense called the witness that the prosecutor no longer wanted to call the defense will be put in the position of asking the witness neutral questions because it is the witness 
is the witness for the defense. And that entitles the prosecutor then to cross-examine the witness. And so that created that conundrum. And the prosecutor said, look, Bungan, no, we don't want to call this witness anymore. And the defense are saying, no, you must call the witness. Or if you, the prosecution, no longer wants the witness, the chamber should call the witness. And then the prosecutor said, well, if that happens, we are entitled to cross-examine the witness. If the witness is recalled, either because we've been forced to recall this witness or because the chamber has recalled the witness. Yeah, you see what I'm getting at? Your, your Honours, I see what you're getting at. But, but and, and then... And then we then see, I mean, of course you would tell me that, well, the timber also says that, 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 that is immaterial, uh, ultimately, that the prosecutor no longer wanted to call the witness. But the materiality of the matter may well be that the prosecutor is being said, told, well, you have to call this witness, you have to continue with this witness. And then the compromise situation might have arisen where, well, in that case, it seems it's not fair to have the pros compare the prosecution prosecutor to call a witness they no longer want to call, we can oh. give the prosecutor leeway to cross-examine. Do you think that is a fair assessment of that jurisprudence? Your Honour, I, 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 I take Your Honour's point, and, and obviously it goes without saying that every case is different and must be considered on its merits. But the only material difference I would submit is that in the Lubanga case, the witness recanted after he was in the witness box at a stage where the prosecution is, as I understand it, not then free to decide whether or not to continue with the witness. I know the prosecution argued otherwise, but uh, the court found against, the chamber found against him in that case. Uh, so the question then should be, uh, does it make a difference whether the witness has recanted before or after he gives his evidence? Now, Your Honours, that is a question which has already been argued before, Your Honours. It was argued during the course of the uh, summons litigation, and if I understand Your Honours ruling correctly, it was rejected. Does that take you now given of the Lubanga just now, and I'm not suggesting at all that it is an unreasonable take on that jurisprudence, but does it really help you in the sense that the defense are arguing that you knew quite well that this witness would be hostile if we accepted that that is where this thing is going. Is it right for you to drag the witness in for purposes of then saying, right, we knew you would not want to come, so we're getting you here as soon as you come into the witness stand, we'll declare you hostile and cross-examine you. That's the question the defendants are raising for you to yeah. answer. And Your Honours, in my submission, it's the same question that they raised on the last occasion and the same question Your Honours argued. And if I may refer Your Honours to paragraph 187, of Your Honour's decision on the witness summons, it's decision number 1274, Core 2, second corrected version. Um, starting at 100, page 100, paragraph 186, the Chamber notes the defence's argument that, potentially host that the potential hostility of eight witnesses limits the value of their anticipated testimonies, and the submissions made in support of witness 15, of the 50, witness 15, wit fitness request, I beg your pardon. The important part is the following. The Chamber is not persuaded by these arguments at 187. Regarding the potential hostility of the eight witnesses, until any witness has been given an opportunity to take the stand, take the oath, and take questions in examination in chief, it would be speculative to declare the witness hostile. Even then, there is no known wisdom that hostile witnesses are incapable of testifying to the truth under oath. And, and you, you, your honours carry on. The witness test, uh, uh, um, de deposed to his affidavit less than three weeks ago after indicating to the prosecution that he was prepared to come and testify voluntarily. 
He was on his en route to meet the VW to come to The Hague to testify involuntarily. Over the course of two days, there's a sudden change of heart. There is history to this as well, which the prosecution will seek to, to, to go through with this witness, which may shed some light on his sudden change of heart. But the point is, the prosecution is not to know in advance whether the witness made this affidavit under some sort of duress and whether or not he would um, stick to this version in his affidavit under oath or whether indeed he would, as we say, come clean and tell the court what happened and why he changed his version. But there is another purpose as well. Your Honours, the issue of, of Rule 68 has been raised pertinently by the prosecution. And there are preliminary steps which must be taken before a witness's statement can be admitted under Rule 68. Firstly, the prosecution needs to exhaust all reasonable measures to get the witness to court. If those fail, then the prosecution has, uh, and the prosecution can establish uh, um, uh, improper interference, the prosecution has met the requirements. If the witness comes to court, it then needs to be established whether or not the, 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 the witness's false evidence is materially influenced by improper influence, threats, bribery, etc. So there are procedural reasons why the prosecution is entitled to do this. And um, it, is, it is not fair, we say, to the prosecution to say that just because you had warning that the witness may not answer favorably, you are then precluded from taking these necessary steps which you might require. I don't think that is the point, really. The point is not that you may not compel a witness to come to court. The point is uh, a witness that has not yet taken the stand and started testifying, it, it may be premature to start ruling that they're coming to lie or not lie, or they will be hostile. They may well come when they take the stand, uh, uh, prove useful or not, but this the preliminary step of saying, okay, these are the areas I want to converse with this witness. You go through those, and then once it is clear that there's no getting anything useful out of the witness compared to what they had deposed to in the past, then we come to the point so the potential hostile witnesses becomes then a question of all right, move from be, uh, beyond the point of being a potential to being a really, uh, a really hostile witness on the stand. That is the issue. Your Honours, my observation on, the, on that issue is that the issue is the same whether or not the witness has indicated previously that he uh, resiles from his earlier statement or whether he does so on the stand. You still need to establish uh, um, that the witness is uh, uh, um, not willing to give material portions of, of his testimony. But it would be a very inefficient way of dealing with the matter in my, my respectful submission to require the prosecution to lead, to, to um, take the witness's evidence in the normal matter, manner of evidence and chief through each and every issue before being permitted to go, to go back and then cross-examine him on it. My submission, Your Honours, is that once it becomes clear that the, that the witness has deviated and recanted on material portions, it doesn't have to be every material portion, material portions of his affidavit, the reasons why he was called to testify, it's far more efficient to, at that stage, provided the chamber is satisfied of that, declare the, the witness hostile and then allow the rest of the, the issues to be dealt with more, more swiftly and, and expeditiously. Shouldn't that, that probably should have been your starting point uh, by saying, look, there's some areas of this testimony so far, and here they are, where the witness has said something that are inconsistent with what the witness said in the uh, in his statement. And you've done that now in your reply. And you lay it out, then you argue, is it then necessary to wait until you've exhausted all of it, or is it enough for us to proceed from here? But beyond that, there's another question the counsel on the opposite side have engaged. 
And that question arose from your signaling what you intend ultimately to do, or me to, and that is make a Rule 68 application. And Mr. Khan raised the matter, and although Ms. Bassman didn't specifically ad uh, address it, she adopted everything Mr. Khan had said. And the point is, can you really do a 68 the application on this witness. Uh, I, the Chamber thinks it's important for you, for us to deal with this now, so you know what you may or may not do with this witness, and that may guide, out of fairness to you, how you ask your questions and what you seek to do. The question is, can you, at the end of the process, say, Your Honours, in light of what the witness has said, in light of what you think of the witness, the we should think of the witness, uh, you would want to apply, make a Rule 68 application. Your Honours, um, the prosecution submits that provided the requirements of Rule 68 are met, that should be permissible. However, um, given the burden which, which Rule 68 2D places on the prosecution to establish that, in this case, the witness's failure to testify in accordance with material portions of his prior statement was materially affected by improper interference, the prosecution would in all likelihood not make that application at this stage. It may well be necessary to provide the Chamber with ancillary evidence to support that finding. There are two things, so we can move quickly to, to it. Um, the first issue is intrinsic to Rule 68 itself, what it says, what it is, what it contemplates. But before we even get to that, there is the matter Mr. Ken directly engaged yesterday. He says um, in the, he made it a matter of travel of Rule 68. The state's parties have indicated that Rule 68 should not apply to ongoing cases. I think it's more than um, travel as such. Uh, the resolution adopting Rule 68 says in paragraph 2, I don't know if you have that, the resolution, but I can read it. I out. don't have that before oh, me. Right. Let me read it. Paragraph 2 of ICC-ASP slash 12 slash res 7. And paragraph 2 says, Further decides that the following shall replace Rule 68 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, emphasizing, and indeed the word emphasizing is emphasized, emphasizing Article 51, Paragraph 4 of the Rome Statute, according to which amendments to the rules of procedure and evidence shall not be applied retroactively to the detriment of the person who is being investigated or prosecuted, with understanding that the rule is amended is without prejudice to Article 67, and so on and so forth. But here, the adopting resolution explicitly says emphasizes that paragraph 51, article 51, paragraph 4. Let's look at what it says. Article 51, paragraph 4, it says, 
the rules of procedure and evidence, amendments thereto, and any provisional rule shall be consistent with this statute. Amendments to the rules of procedure and evidence as well as provisional rules shall not be applied retroactively to the detriment of the person who is being investigated or prosecuted or who has been convicted, unquote. Thank you, Your Honours. Yes, uh, the prosecution is well aware of that provision. The um, first document of the ASP which you read out does nothing more in my respectful submission than direct the reader to 51.4. Now, um, perhaps a, a full arguing, uh, argument of this point may in my sub respectful submission be beyond the scope of, of this hearing because it's something which uh, uh, parties might want to give a uh, full written argument on. But my submission is that as it stands, Article 51.4 presents absolutely no bar to the Chamber applying Rule 68 in this case. What Article 51.4 does not say is that an amendment to, to the rules may not be applied to an ongoing case, which is what my learned friend suggested uh, when he rose, uh, argued on the matter the other day. What it says is it may not be replied retroactively to the detriment of the accused person. And there are two parts to that argument. One is it may not be applied retroactively, and secondly, if it is applied retroactively, it may not be to the detriment of the accused. Both of those, uh, uh, it's a combined prohibition, as it were. The prosecution submission is that the, the Chamber is not engaged in any form of retroactive application of this rule. And the important point to remember is that, Your Honours, this is not a penal statute. It is a procedural rule. Now, the, the, the rules, the general principles of legality say that penal statutes may not be applied retroactively. The rationale behind that is that people should be aware at the time that they commit or perform certain actions that they might be punished for those actions and it would be unfair to subsequently decide that it may be a crime to step on the cracks and someone steps on the cracks and tomorrow he's prosecuted. But this is a simple procedural matter. I, I want to understand you, your interpretation of retroactive. You say there are two things. First, um, what is meant by retroactive. Before we do that, let's, let, let me make this very clear. Uh, the reason why I raise this matter now, uh, you say maybe beyond the scope of this application, uh, it's up to you, really, in, in a way. Is uh, the sense in which it may be in your interest for a determination to be made so you know where you stand. You don't want to be in a position where a decision is made on 604 and then when we get through your application on, uh, on whether you can use the statement on the 68 and in fact decision may not be in your favor and then you complain that well had I known I might have organized myself differently. That's why it may be fair to you to have this out of the way so you know where you stand on 68. Don't you think? Yes, certainly, uh, Your Honours, that would be helpful, of course. I, I, it would have been far more helpful if I'd had uh, a notice of, of this issue. Uh, but it happens that, uh, that I have given it some thought, and, and I may certainly address some preliminary remarks on, on this question. If, if we're limited to the, to the question at the moment of any bar to the application of Rule 68, I think I can address that point at least. So, so with that clarification, remember that was a clarification along the way to one question I was going to ask you. And then you say retroactive, that the provision 51.4 uh, says amendment may not be applied retroactively. To the, to the detriment of a person who is being investigated or who is being prosecuted or has been. And you say that, what? Sorry. Your, Your Honours, what it doesn't say is the provision may not be applied to a person who is being investigated or is being prosecuted. It may not be applied retro, retroactively to the detriment of such a person. 
So it is the issue of retroactivity and the fact that it's being applied to the detriment with which I take issue. Obviously, I don't take issue that, that we are looking at a person who is being prosecuted or persons who are being prosecuted. And what is the, the first floor, the first part of it, before we come back to the second limb of the, your, your observation, who is being prosecuted or uh, investigated? Uh, what is your interpretation of retroactive in the context of adoption of rule, an amendment in the middle of an ongoing case? Your Honor, if, for instance, a rule were brought in uh, dealing perhaps with um, under, say, Article 71, which made certain conduct that an accused might have done uh, uh, an offence for which he might be punishable, that might be a retroactive application. But here we're dealing with a procedural matter. It's a matter, of the, it's a matter related to the court's determination of the admissibility of evidence. The rule is in place. The rule is in place. It's been in place since November last year. The prosecution are seeking to use, to rely on that rule now, uh, nine months, ten months after the rule is put in place. The prosecution says this is not retroactive application. We're looking at present facts, facts many of which didn't even uh, arise at the time the rule was changed. Um, secondly, this is not, well, that's the first on the issue of, of, of retroactivity. With respect to procedural regulations and rules, the prosecution's submission is that provided the regulation or procedure is in place at the time, either party, not just the prosecution, either party, the, the defense can rely on this rule too, at the time the party wishes to rely on it, that does not amount to a retroactive application. Um, if, for instance, the chamber had ruled, had uh, um, rendered its final decision on the case, or let's say uh, at the end of the prosecution case, the uh, defense brought a no case to answer motion and the chamber upheld it. If at that stage the prosecution then said, but wait, I have more statements I want to hand in, that might be said to be a retroactive application because a certain stage had been reached, uh, a, a ruling had been made which would have to then be undone. And that would, I do not uh, uh, quibble with, that would be a retroactive application. But at the moment, we are in the, in the process of a case. Uh, a problem has arisen regarding witnesses not wishing to come to court or not testifying according to their um, statements. A remedy is available at that time, and the application of that remedy at that time, in my submission, would not be retroactive. On the issue of um, whether or not well, so it fails on the first leg in my submission, but even if it could be considered to be a retroactive application, my submission is it is not to the detriment of the accused in this, in this case. Firstly, it is the retroactive application that must be to the detriment of the accused. It is not sufficient that the accused is faced with incriminatory evidence. The material which the prosecution seeks to hand in, or will seek to hand in, is material that the accused have always been, to their knowledge, at risk, at risk of being confronted with during the course of the prosecution case. The statements that the prosecution will seek to tender form a significant part of the basis of the uh, um, document containing the charges. They've all been disclosed to the defense many, many months ago, and there should be no element of surprise here. The prejudice which may arise, of course, is the fact that in certain, the case of certain of these witnesses, not this witness, but certain other witnesses, if they don't come to court, the, prosecute, the defense may be deprived of an opportunity to cross-examine the witness. But that is a matter of prejudice as a result of the application of the rule, but not as a result of the retroactive application of the rule. And it is a matter which is catered for specifically in Rule 68, because one of the factors which the Chamber is required to consider is whether or not the interests of justice would be served 
by allowing the prior recorded testimony to be introduced. So it is, at, it is at that point that such prejudice should appropriately be considered. It will go with you one moment, please. Um, I also observe that the rule has other important safeguards, such as the threshold which the prosecution must um, cross before the, the documents may be admitted, and that is to establish, in my submission on a balance of probabilities, that there has indeed been improper interference and that that has materially affected either the non-appearance of the witness or his failure to testify on material portions of his evidence. The next point, the next question I have for you, as I said, that I had questions in two areas. One is the, uh, the extrinsic um, circumstance of 68, which we've seen uh, traced in Article 51.4, and the second is the intrinsic uh, question of Rule 68. Is it about statements or testimony? Your Honour, in, in my respectful submission, prior recorded testimony includes witness statements. Um, and this issue, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have the uh, references exactly to hand, uh, but this is, is, is a matter or a, a concept which is not foreign to the uh, ad hoc tribunals. And uh, I, I speak under correction, but I'm fairly certain that there is authority in the ad hoc tribunals to the effect that, to the effect that prior recorded statements uh, include witness statements. Um, but, in, but in looking at the wording of Article 68.1, from line three, allow the introduction, the court, the chamber may, trial chamber may, and I read from line three, allow the introduction of previously recorded audio or video testimony of a witness or the transcript or other documented evidence of such testimony, other documented evidence. In my submission, the plain language of that, having distinguished it from audio, video, and transcripts can only mean or certainly encompasses prior statements made by the witness. Now let's take that again. Let's begin from the beginning. When the pre-trial chamber has not taken measures under Article 56, the trial chamber may, in accordance with Article 69, Paragraph 2 and 4, and after hearing the parties, allow the introduction of previously recorded audio or video testimony of a witness. Uh, let's stop there. Uh, so far, it's talking about audio or video recorded testimony. Yes. You're, you're uh, it isn't yet talking about transcript. No. And then we continue, the second part. Or the transcript or other documented evidence of such testimony Witness. So, on each occasion, the provision seems to be talking about testimony, either audio or video recorded, or reduced to transcript, or there's other evidence of testimony. Your Honours, I do understand that, uh, the, again, in the Labunga case, there is a decision on this matter. If I may just uh, find the reference, please. Yes, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. 
from, from this document? In fairness to you, uh, as you rightly pointed out, you were not given um, prior uh, notice of this argument. But then defense will say, well, you should have known what the provision says, including 51.4. The point is, I think, is uh, in order that we're all fully on board with what the law is and what the thinking is. Um, you, you may, in the course of the testimony of this witness, we may, if you see that it's necessary to return to this after you've done further research, uh, we can entertain that briefly. Point, thank, thank you, Your Honor, yes. but uh, I the found the... I, say, I wanted to flag that yes. it is in your interest to know where you stand on it, so you're not caught by surprise at the end of uh, when you want to use do a 68 application down the line. Your Honours, I'm grateful, but I have found the reference I was looking for. Perhaps I can just um, draw Your Honours' attention to that in the meantime. Um, it is the Labanga decision, which uh, is decision 1603, in paragraphs 18 to 19 which holds that Rule 68, quote, is directed at the testimony of a witness in a broad sense, given that the various forms of testimony that are specifically included in the, in the rule are audio and video records, transcripts of other documented evidence. I think that should read, or other documented evidence. Yes, transcripts or other documented evidence of such testimony, namely the testimony of a witness. So the Labanga Chamber interpreted such testimony to mean the testimony of a witness, but not limited to the audio or video testimony of a witness. The Chamber highlights particularly that the, quote, other documented evidence, unquote, in brackets, of the, the testimony of the witness, close brackets, is referred to separately and in addition to the audio or video records in the opening paragraph of Rule 68. Moreover, in sub-rules A and B, as they were at that time, previous, quote, previous recorded testimony, unquote, is referred to without limiting its scope to video or audio evidence. Against that background, the Chamber is persuaded that the ambit of Rule 68 permits the introduction of written statements in addition to video or audio tape records or transcripts of a witness's testimony because they are all examples of the, quote, documented evidence, unquote, of a witness's testimony, close, final quotes. Um, the Katanga and Ngujola decision. Does, does, does Katanga, oh, was that Lubanga you That said? was Lubanga, Your Honours. Did it define the term testimony? Um, Your Honours, I don't have the original, I'm quoting from an, an extract in a, in, a, in a memorandum, so I don't have the original with me, unfortunately. I, I can't answer that question. I, I, I don't know that it does. Um, but it, it may be observed, uh, Your Honours, that, that testimony does not necessarily refer only to evidence given in a court of law under oath. I think. Uh, but, but I think you. I don't think you get an argument on that. that an affidavit, for example. Yes. 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 Uh, may come in. And under a definition of testimony, an affidavit made under oath. Your Honours, um, does it mean that every other statement comes in as well? The police officer, the crime scene. Your, Your Honours, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that every other document, but certainly a document in the nature of an affidavit. Um, and I, I would observe, Your Honours, that uh, um, statements are taken by the prosecution in this case in one of two manners, generally speaking. Either a written statement will be taken, uh, which is read back to and signed by the witness who acknowledges and confirms the correctness of that statement. Alternatively, for witnesses who are considered at risk of incriminating themselves, the um, statements would be audio recorded and subsequently transcribed. In my submission, it would be very strange if the latter were admitted but not the former, um, for the only reason that, that that it was recorded. 
Both of them amount to statements given by a witness solemnly to the prosecution, acknowledging that they, uh, they affirm the correctness of the contents. Um, referring then, while well, I'm on my feet then, to the Katanga and Ngujolo decisions, uh, these identify other bases of support, and I quote from decision decision on the prosecution's bar table motion. Um, I don't have the decision number, unfortunately, but I can find that. It's uh, paragraph 44 of that decision, which says the following. Clearly, statements made out of court can equally qualify as testimony. In fact, it's what we were talking about. This is apparent from the wording of Article 56.1a, which refers to, quote, a unique opportunity to take testimony, unquote, and of Article 93.1b, which expressly mentions the taking of evidence, quote, including testimony under oath, unquote. In the context of assistance provided by state parties, again quoting, in relation to investigations or prosecutions, unquote. Moreover, a narrow interpretation of the word testimony in Article 67.1a would entirely undermine the very right protected by this article and deprive Rule 68 of any meaning. I'll bear with you one moment. Is there a question of fairness arising <clears throat> for a witness if testimony is given that broad an acceptation? So um, a witness, for instance, being interviewed by a policeman, <coughs> and the witness is perhaps not telling the truth for any reason, whether to exonerate themselves or for whatever reason, at the end of which the witness signs the statement after it had been reread, and if yes, this is my statement, the witness signs it. And, and later on, do we not have an issue for the witness to say, well, now you can be prosecuted for perjury because this is testimony. Your Honours, I submit that that does, does not really arise because the definition of perj perjury, certainly in, 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 in my jurisdiction, would be evidence given under oath, false evidence given under oath. So that was the definition of testimony as well? N Your Honour, no. I, my, my submission is that it goes broader than simply evidence given under oath, remembering that the prosecution, the practice of the prosecution in, 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 the, in this uh, institution is not to take evidence under oath. Is it defined by the practice of the prosecution or an objective legal standard of what testimony is? Your, your Honours, <laughs> what is a crime is defined by the, by the definition of a crime. The crime, uh, certainly in this court, under, under Article 70, is giving false evidence having been warned under Article 69. So a witness in this court who gives a false statement to the prosecution, unfortunately, is not liable for prosecution under, under Article 71A, because the prosecution, because only the court is given the power to administer that oath. And, and it's a matter which I've, I've long decried and, and maybe a matter which, which the Assembly might, might wish to revisit in its wisdom in due course. Because in my submission, many of the difficulties in this case might have been dealt with, and I don't think my learned friends would, would argue about this, if witnesses were at peril of prosecution for giving false statements to the, to the prosecutor, sorry, at peril of prosecution for giving false statements to the OTP. Can you look at Article 70 sub 1A that you just alluded to? Yes, I have it. Right. It is a crime to give a court, I'll take it. The court shall have jurisdiction over the following offences against its administration of justice when committed intentionally. A giving false testimony when under an obligation pursuant to Article 69, Paragraph 1, to tell the truth. Does Article 69, Paragraph 1 really add anything when you look at it? What, it, what does it do? 
Your Honour. 69, 69, paragraph 1 says, Before testifying, each witness shall, in accordance with the rules of procedure and evidence, give an undertaking <coughs> as to the truthfulness of the evidence to be given by the witness, basically the oath. Isn't that it? Yes, Your Honours, but interpreting this provision in its context, which is under Part 6, which deals with the trial, the interpretation that, prevailing interpretation, I understand it, is that that applies to um, testimony before the court after an oath is given by the judge, by the, by, by, by the bench. So you, you say that your point is that on that basis, before this court, such a witness, no witness may be prosecuted if all they did was give a statement that was deemed to be a testament by some legal mechanism. What about prejudice to the witness outside of this court? Either is some law that says anybody who gives false testimony may be prosecuted. Say, for example, it wasn't the prosecutor that took the statement from the witness, but maybe the prosecutor received the assistance of a state using the um, national mechanisms to obtain statement from the witness under the national mechanism. Can the witness not be prosecuted? Your Honours, my submission is that these, these hypotheticals do not affect the, the definition of testimony for the purposes of Rule 68. Whether or not a witness is liable to prosecution in their national jurisdiction is an issue which is quite separate from the determination of this chamber about whether or not his prior statement amounts to testament. That's my one observation. But um, again, I can't speculate as to that because it would all depend on the law in that country. Whether the law in that country would, would, would recognize a statement made to the prosecution under a solemn declaration, I think we can refer to it as as liable to prosecution for perjury or whether or not they require a higher standard. But my, my submission is that it, it's, a, it's a very fascinating argument, but perhaps one that need not engage us for present purposes. Well, you can see it as fascinating. I have a feeling that counsel for witnesses may not think it's fascinating or beyond the realms of something that should worry them. Uh, but if you finish speaking on the matter, we can leave it at that. I think for now that uh, has exhausted my reserves. Mr. Ken. I'm grateful, Mr. President. If, if I may, uh, dealing briefly with the first matter, um, my learned friend once again ha has uh, referred to the Labanga case, and, Your Honour, the defence can do no better than to, with great respect, endorse um, the, uh, the position postulated by uh, uh, Your Honour uh, at paragraphs 3, 4, and 12 as to the distinguishing features. Uh, that led uh, the Labanga Trial Chamber to make uh, the decision that it did. But, Your Honour, in assessing the merits of the application of the prosecution, uh, we say it's important to, to step back. And what is the purpose? Uh, there's no magic in a label, hostile uh, or even in cross-examination. Uh, the prosecution and, uh, have said, the defence have said, and the bench have reiterated on many occasions that one of the key objectives is to get to the truth. Uh, and, Your Honour, at paragraph 19 and 20 of the Labanga decision, the Learned Trial Chamber were very clear that one of the reasons why they allowed, apart from the issues of fairness that Your Honour uh, referred to in the earlier part of the decision, they said not allowing the prosecution uh, to cross-examine would potentially impede the Chamber in the pursuit of the truth. And similarly, at the end of the paragraph, if the prosecutor is restricted to neutral questions, he would be unable to explore adequately the circumstances of the change of account. 
Uh, Your Honour, we say that's important because there's been really, uh, if not no attempt, a very uh, scanty attempt by the prosecution to attempt uh, thoroughly to uh, sieve out truth and fiction uh, from uh, any previous accounts uh, from the witness. And, Your Honour, uh, that can be done by way of neutral questions. Your Honours uh, will, of course, be alive to the fact that we're not here judging the veracity of uh, an affidavit or the veracity of a previous statement given to the prosecution or domestic authority. But what the court wants to do and is to encourage witnesses, hence the importance of the Article 70 warning, is that you have a most onerous responsibility. This is a somber occasion to speak the truth, knowing that the consequences that the court is assessing that evidence and Your Honour, that's why the key objective must be getting the truth and a full account as possible uh, from the witness in the box. And Your Honour, uh, given even the Labanga decision, I referred yesterday to Katanga, uh, Your Honour, there's been no um, a persuasive reason we, we respectfully submit as to why the prosecution can't make further and proper investigations by way of non-leading questions. Uh, there's no uh, persuasive reasons why um, leading questions are necessary in order, to, uh, prevent, in order to allow the, the trial chamber to get to the truth. That can be done in the normal way, as we do with normal witnesses. And, Your Honor, let me give you an example. The, the witnesses said uh, parts of the uh, testimony are true, parts are false. Maybe the same with the, with the affidavits. That can be inquired into. Your Honor, in previous occasions, the prosecution have been but extremely... It, but what the prosecution is now saying, it wasn't... They didn't begin with their submission with that when they made the application the first run of it. But in reply, they've now pointed out, saying, here are some, we've done neutral questions here. The answer we received from the witness is inconsistent with what the witness said in the statement, a lot of it. We've done neutral questions there, and it's inconsistent. We've done it here and there, it's inconsistent. So they've now outlined areas in which they have asked neutral questions and did not get uh, got an answer that they say is materially inconsistent with or fundamentally inconsistent with the testimony they uh, oh, sorry with the um, uh, testimony that is inconsistent with what they have in the statement the question then is should they continue to ask neutral questions in all the other areas of interest to them or is it say well there's enough now to consider whether to allow the prosecution uh, to really go all out and try and get to the truth as you say yes. well you're one of my submissions yesterday that it was premature the application was premature because the prosecution haven't done that uh, which is necessary even on their own case, we say, to declare a witness hostile. Your Honour will recall, the bench will recall, that on several occasions during the witness's testimony, uh, when uh, a question was posed, my learned friend Mr. Steinberg says, I'll come back to that. Uh, on many occasions, or at least on one or two occasions, uh, the witness said, I can't remember. Uh, Your Honours will, uh, will recall well that in previous witnesses, the prosecution couldn't wait to refresh a witness's memory. Why on earth now are they so reluctant to refresh a witness's memory uh, that says, uh, I can't remember? Uh, Your, Your Honor, so what we say is important, uh, given the nature of the account, and there'd be no objection to it. Whatever, one t whatever the term of art is one wishes to ascribe to it, uh, the prosecution can, go, can ask certain questions, and if the court give leave, can say, okay, Mr. Witness, you gave a statement. Is this the statement? Yes. You said this. Why did you say that? and get an explanation. Uh, Your Honour, if the witness is not desirous of telling the truth, if the witness is um, refusing to answer, contumacious refusal in the face of the court, certain action may be taken. But we don't need to jump to discredit a party's own witness. Uh, Your Honour has already pointed out uh, one of the many differences between this and the Banga case. The prosecution have conduct of their case. They make their strategic choices, not us. And they chose to call this witness, uh, notwithstanding the affidavit. Now, Your Honor, this is not contrary to the summons. 
because what Your Honours decided in the summons is that a witness should be called. It didn't deal with the modalities of questioning, and so they are completely unrelated uh, aspects. Uh, so, Your Honour, that's my submission in relation to hostility. If we want to get to the truth, let the witness explain, and it can be done in a methodical manner. You've said this? Did you say that? Yeah, okay. Is it the truth? Yes or no? If yes, they've got it. If no, why did you say it? And, Your Honour, that's the proper way to do it. And, of course, the court can keep it under um, review. The prosecution can make other applications later. But they're jumping the gun, which is why I said yesterday it's premature. And for that reason, it should be defeated. Your Honour, in relation to the uh, Rule 68, um, Your Honour has uh, uh, turned, in fact, to the um, correct uh, document in the Assembly of State Parties. And my learned friends attempt to say while it's a procedural rule, should be given uh, short shrift in relation to Article 51. It was for that very reason why the Assembly of State Parties wished to underscore the, and emphasize the importance that that rule would not be used by the prosecution in ongoing cases. Uh, and Your Honor, Ambassador McKenna is in the gallery. She was the representative of Kenya at the Assembly of State Parties. Uh, it, I said a couple of days ago, I think it was a couple of days ago, that it's bad faith of the prosecution. Let, let, let's not bring Ambassador McKenna into it. Just make your submission. Uh, Your yes. Honour, I, I said it was bad faith because the prosecutor was present. They have the statute talking about uh, uh, non-retroactivity. Uh, this is consistent, in fact, with the ICTY rules of procedure and evidence, uh, which uh, Rule 6, I think it is, says that a, a rule change will not be applied to the detriment of an accused. A rule change. But, Your Honours, the Assembly of State Parties uh, made it even clearer that it applied to a specific procedural rule, so the argument that it shouldn't apply because it's procedural really falls flat on its face, we say. Uh, the Assembly of State Parties wished to emphasise it, and it was passed on undertakings that it would not be used in relation to ongoing cases. And for the prosecution, and the prosecutor herself and her representatives were present in the ASP to now seek to put forward uh, arguments that somehow they wish to do that which they know is not allowed, we say is regrettable, and I've said bad faith previously. You know, the other aspect, Rule 68 doesn't even apply at all to this present case because the witness is here. And Rule 68 too, of course, primarily is talking about uh, uh, evidence of a witness uh, who is not before the court. But, Your Honour, even when a witness is before the court, if one looks at uh, 68 to uh, D1, uh, um, the prosecution, and this again supports my argument about the proper procedure, they haven't said, witness, you said this, can you explain? And so the witness has not failed to give evidence with respect to a material aspect including in his prior, prior statement. The prosecution are not even attempting to go there. Instead, they want to introduce, they've said repeatedly, what we've called a wild goose chase, Article 70 and other matters to controvert the witness. Let's stay focused on the PEV, the veracity of the account, because the prosecution said, and it's their own words, why would anybody interfere with a witness that's not telling the truth? We agree with that, actually. But, Your Honour, uh, we say that the prosecution have failed to understand the proper ambit of Rule 68, how it applies in the present circumstances, and it's directly linked to the proper procedure that should be adopted uh, with the witness that Your Honours um, uh, have before you. I'm grateful. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, again, you don't, if you don't need to add to it, you, you can just adopt things. And I, I will adopt everything that's been said, but I have... Um, like very few things to add. If we are speaking about uh, Rule 68B, um, well, we have already one commentary who says that um, the non-retroactivity applies to the definition of crimes as well as the general principles of the procedural and evidentiary regime. This is Shabas in his commentary on the Rome Statute. I'm sure we will discuss this at a later stage. I just wanted to point that out. But, um, and, and Rule 68B, um, according to, our, to your own decision, and this is number 847, this is the decision on conduct of proceedings. Uh, how much longer? 
not that I you've spoken too much already, just that we actually streamed past the break point. Two minutes? All right. Um, this, uh, this is your decision on the conduct of the proceedings, uh, number 847, and let me just read out paragraph 28, which states that when a party wishes to introduce prior recorded testimony in accordance with Rule 68B, um, it shall file an application to that effect at least 21 days before the witness is scheduled to appear. So I think in any event, um, this, this, the art, this article, this rule cannot apply to this particular situation. Um, in addition, just one line, um, I, I do agree but it is particularly, uh, I think testimony is clearly in, 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 in not just in my view or in yours, uh, we can find authorities sworn testimony, which is not what we have. And it's particularly delicate when you want to uh, rely on a prior statement if someone later on recounts. There is a real prejudice there. And the only case I can think of this has happened before in the, in the ICTY. This was when it was all recorded. We had a video recorded. This was the most important aspect of that decision. Uh, I can cite it for you. I'm a bit worried about the time. Uh, the reason why they said we can uh, tender these statements because we can see the demeanor from the video and at the end of the day in their decision they did not rely on these witnesses because they were not trustworthy. Um, uh, we are not in this situation, as I said, Rule 68 doesn't even come into it uh, and, so, and, and it would be incredibly unfair if, if uh, we would go that route. Thank you. We will Adjourn now, but one second. We will adjourn now. We will um, come back at 10 past 12. All rise, we will be.